Let us worship God. Let's sing to his praise from Psalm 63. Psalm 63. And singing the first eight verses. Lord, thee my God, I'll early seek. My soul doth thirst for thee. My flesh longs in a dry parched land wherein no waters be that I thy power may behold and brightness of thy face as I have seen thee heretofore within thy holy place. So verses 1 to 8. pray. O Lord, our God, we come before your throne of grace singing the psalm that your Holy Spirit inspired the psalmist to write down, that all generations might sing it, and may we sing it from the heart, that we might Uh, enter into the words expressed there that we will seek your face and be pleased uh, to see your face at the end of the day when all is said and done uh, when we leave this world our full joy will be to see your face and we thank you that the Lord Jesus on earth said, those who have seen me have seen the Father. We thank you that it is possible to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, and thereby have everlasting life. We 
thank you for the blessings of this day, the peace we have enjoyed, the food and the shelter we depend upon. All of this comes from your goodness and the bread from heaven, manna for our souls. We thank you for the Lord Jesus. Apart from him, we can do nothing and apart from him, we would be lost eternally. But in Christ, we are adopted into the family of God and our destiny is to see his face and to be like him, to be finally without sin and able to enjoy your presence comfortably and happily and f with fullness of joy. But here on earth, we are surrounded by darkness and even the remnants of sin working within us. <clears throat> we disappoint ourselves and we know therefore we disappoint you also. But we look to you to work within us more of your life-changing, uh, miraculous transformation. We thank you that one day we are destined to be like the Lord Jesus so we thank you, Lord, that we can gather freely and peacefully this night to meditate upon your word. And we ask that you would encourage us uh, in our earthly walk. It, it is a comfort for us to know that Christ has walked this through this world uh, first. He has led the way and we follow in his footsteps. Give us grace to follow faithfully. The outcome is assured for all who are in Christ. We thank you that a glory in your presence uh, awaits everyone who trusts in Christ. So Father, this evening hour, we ask that your spirit would enlighten us and speak to us in our hearts directly about our walk with you. May we become knowledgeable, more knowledgeable than ever about your promises, your great and glorious promises that cheer our, heart, <coughs> our hearts in the despondency of walking through the wilderness that this world can be. Help us to remember that the whole world in all its fallenness still is full of the glory of God. Help us to see your hand in everything. Help us to see how you have led us in the past and taken us through joys and sorrows, working in us, refining us, preparing us, for your nearer presence one day for all eternity. We thank you then that it is true that all things work together for good to those who love you, who are called according to your purpose. And even the worst things you can uh, take us through for our good. And so when it is all over, we shall be satisfied with your face and with your fellowship and your beauty and your power. And we will finally be at home. Forgive us, Lord, when we cling to this world as though this was our only home. How strange we will think this world was when we are at home in heaven, looking back on how we got there what a strange place this may seem at long last and how we would be like the Apostle Paul, knowing that to depart and be with Christ is far better. And yet you keep us here for all manner of purposes to serve you until that time when you call us to our final home. Truly it will be home. It will be the Father's house. So we ask that you who dwell in every believer would make us 
aware of your presence and power and give us victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil. Be with us in this evening hour because our meeting would be in vain without your presence with us. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. A reminder of the intimations. The next service is next Lord's Day, 12 noon in Port Mahomet and 6.30 in Inver. And the expected preacher is the Reverend Thomas Buchanan. The sacrament of baptism is to be administered at the noon service next week to Robert Matthew McLeod. The retiring collection at both services next Lord's Day is for the Fabric Fund. Sunday school next week, 11.15 a.m. in the church vestry. The midweek meeting Wednesday at 7.30 via Zoom. And all these intimations are God willing. Now, let's sing from Psalm 34. Psalm 34. And singing verses 16 to 22. Psalm 34. From verse 16 to the end of the psalm. The face of God is set against those that do wickedly, that he may quite out from the earth cut off their memory. The righteous cry unto the Lord, he unto them gives ear, and they out of their troubles all by him delivered are. <clears throat> so verse 16 to the end.
Now let's read the last chapter of the Bible, book of Revelation, chapter 22. Revelation, chapter 22. From the beginning. <clears throat> and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work, as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. For out with are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst, Come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And we say amen to that reading of God's holy word and pray that we'll have a right understanding of it. Let's spend some more time in prayer for others now. Let's pray.
Our Father in heaven, we all know people who are lost, who don't know the Lord Jesus. And we plead with you that you might, in your mercy, reach out to them through us, that you would enable us to draw close to these people. We think on how the Spirit uh, called Philip into the wilderness to meet the Ethiopian who was struggling to understand the scripture and how he was able to explain the scripture and how the man came to faith with rejoicing and was baptized. And uh, then Philip was whisked away supernaturally to Azotus to serve you there. And so, Lord, help us to feel your leading and prompting. Help us to be able to explain the gospel clearly and wisely to our neighbors. We think, Lord, on how you led us into the faith. And we thank you for all who were crucial in, under your providential plan in bringing us to seek Christ and to find him. We pray then that we in our day and generation might be equally crucial in helping others to find Christ. We pray that you would help us in the matter of prayer, that our prayer meeting would be powerful and acceptable in your sight that you would answer many prayers that we would come with great requests because we are coming to an almighty sovereign lord we pray for those <coughs> far away from home uh, in foreign lands that they might know your presence and power with them, keeping them safe as they travel or as they work, that they may know your presence and power. We think on loved ones that don't know you and ask that we might be a faithful witness, a loving witness, and a firmly clear witness in the matter of truth. We remember loved ones and friends and neighbors that are shut in, that don't get out to a place of worship anymore, that we might find a time and a way of encouragement to these people. We pray for those known to us who spend every day of life struggling with ill health, pain in the head and in the back and in the stomach and in the joints. And, oh, how we long for you to relieve their symptoms and if it please you, take them away altogether. We ask that you would give them grace for each day and we thank you that they can be a blessing to others. Even if they are housebound, they are able to pray. We thank you then, Lord, that uh, it is possible to communicate with so many in different ways. But the face-to-face -face visit and fellowship with those who are lonely and frail is a special blessing and we ask that we would uh, take up the opportunity and count it as a great privilege to be an ambassador of Christ. We remember Christ's solemn warning about those who were uh, naked and in prison and sick and were not visited and how he said it's as though you did not visit me you did not provide for me because 
as your word says, for as much as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Help that awesome word to be an encouragement and a satisfaction for us when we are able to meet with those that you guide us to. We pray then for all who have the care of the elderly and the sick and the frail in care homes and in their own homes. And we ask that uh, the, the, the witness of the gospel might be known in these settings. Help us at the start of another week to venture forth in faith, to walk by faith, and to feel the Spirit's guidance, to know what to do and say in this week of opportunity. Once again, we thank you, Lord, that we have so much when other places are in desperate need. And we do pray for the people of Pakistan. They have been flooded out of everything and they are destitute and yet the majority don't know how destitute they really are because they do not have Christ. So as we pray for the relief of their physical needs, we pray also that that land might be awakened to the gospel, that that false religion that grips the land might be seen for what it is and the truth of Christ might prevail. How marvelous it would be in our sight if Pakistan became a land full of Christians and not just Pakistan but all these other uh, deceived nations may they come to know their true need and once again we pray that fighting would cease that food and water and uh, many other needs medicines might be able to be distributed freely amongst these needy places and we give thanks for all that we enjoy and doubtless take for granted. Help us to be wise stewards of the gifts and of, that you have given us and the time that you have given us. We will not be able to say at the end there was not enough time. We have been given plenty time. Help us to use it wisely. Hear us then. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now let's sing from Psalm 27. Psalm 27. And verses 7 to 10. Psalm 27 from verse 7 to 10. O Lord, give ear unto my voice when I do cry to thee. Upon me also mercy have, and do thou answer me. When thou didst say, Seek ye my face, then unto thee reply, Thus did my heart. Above all things, thy face, Lord, seek will I. Verses 7 to 10.
Well, I would like to think on just part of a verse, and it's verse, uh, 20, um, verse 4 in chapter 22 of Revelation, which simply reads, And they shall see his face. Those who are saved to be the servants of God in heaven shall see God's face. Now, in the New Testament, the Greek word uh, that we translate as face, the Greek word prosopon, it, it uh, carries various senses of meaning. And indeed, it's true to say that a variety of uh, the same meanings are found in English. So I'll just give you a few of these meanings to hold in your uh, mind as we come to think on the phrase, and they shall see his face. A first possible meaning of the use of the word face then in the Greek and in the English uh, is the outward appearance of inanimate objects. For example, Matthew 16, 3, where Jesus says, O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but, ye not, uh, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? Uh, or Luke 21, 35, Speaking of the sudden return of Christ, it says, For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Or Acts 17.26 again uses the term in the same way, speaking of how God made from one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of of all the earth. And we're familiar with that usage in English. We talk about the, the face of a clock, for example, and so on. But this meaning does not come into our text this evening at all, because we're talking about the face of the living God. And God is not an object. He's not a theory to be debated. God is a living being. God is spirit. And the Greek word for face literally means the part towards the eyes, which reminds us that the living God has all seeing eyes which are upon us, upon every soul. We live before the face of God. We carry out our life under his gaze. Face can also be used of a person's face. That's an obvious uh, statement. And there's examples of that in Scripture. Uh, in Matthew 6, from verse 16, Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast the criticism of the Pharisees and so on. Um, now, 2 Corinthians 3, 7 reminds us of Moses' face, that it was shining with glory when he came down from the mountain, having received the Ten Commandments. So we're all familiar then with the word referring to a person's actual face. You remember how the enemies of Stephen before he was martyred, they were looking at him, and Acts 6.15 says, and fixing their gaze upon him, uh, all that sat in the council looked steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. The shining of God's glory in some way was shining in the face of Stephen. Thirdly, the word face is used 
uh, of the, the look of the face. Uh, by its various movements, it betrays the thoughts of the person. It's an index of inward thoughts and feelings. In Luke 9:51, um, we read of Jesus, and it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. They could see his resolve. His face had an appearance that betrayed the fact that he was determined to go to Jerusalem. Or 1 Peter 3.12, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. The thoughts and purposes of God are against those who do evil. His face betrays that. So face can mean uh, can show forth the inner thoughts and intentions of a man or a woman or God himself. A fourth use of the term face is to refer to the presence of a person because the face is the noblest part of a person. Acts 3.13 speaks of how Jesus was denied in the presence of Pilate, literally in the face of Pilate. Acts 5.41 speaks of the apostles being flogged and then being released from the presence, literally the face of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy of suffering for the name of Christ. 2 Corinthians 2.10, Paul uh, talks of forgiving others in the presence of Christ, literally in the face of Christ. That's a very solemn, interesting idea, forgiving others in the presence or the face of Christ. Remember that when you're called upon the need to forgive someone. It's in the face of Christ that you do it, before his face. 1 Thessalonians 2.17, Paul says, But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, in presence there, literally, face. They were not able to be present with them. 2 Thessalonians 1.9 speaks of those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel. And it says, they shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence, literally the face of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Fifthly, the word face can stand for the whole person himself uh, Galatians 1.22, Paul says that he was unknown by face unto the regions of Syria and Cilicia. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.17 refers to Paul desiring to see the brethren's face, which meant he wanted to see them. So the face stands for the person. Acts 20, 38, the Ephesians grieved when they heard that Paul was to go away. And what troubled them most was they should see his face no more. But that really refers to his whole being departing from them, that they wouldn't be in his presence, nor would they literally see the familiar face. And a sixth use of the word face in Scripture can refer to the appearance one presents as a wealthy person or a poor person. It can refer to your position or state <clears throat> in, a, in so much as it might bring about favoritism. 
Uh, Matthew 22, 16 refers to some who said to Jesus this, Thou art true, neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men, and the word person there is, a literal translation would be to look to the face of somebody. In other words, to show favoritism is to look to the face of somebody. But Christ was impartial. He didn't show favoritism. So he didn't look to the face of anybody. And in Galatians 2.6, Paul says that God accepteth no man's person. Literally, God receives not the face of any man. And Jude, verse 16, speaks of those who flatter people for the sake of gaining advantage, literally admiring faces for the sake of advantage. And, of course, uh, what we were considering this morning, uh, it should be noted that to spit in a person's face is an expression of the utmost scorn and aversion. Then they did spit in Christ's face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands. And we considered that at some length this morning. Now, why did I give you these flavors of the use of the term face? We are considering Revelation 22, 4, and they shall see his face. And we should hold these various uses of the term face when we consider what it means to look at God's face. First of all, then, we, we have to say that it's a sheer marvel that any human being should see the face of God. Yet, it would seem that in the beginning, in some way, that privilege was afforded to Adam and Eve as normality. In Genesis 3.8, we read of them, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, it doesn't actually say that they were in the habit of looking into his face, but I think it would be very hard to discount that possibility because they obviously had close communion with God. And elsewhere in Scripture, that sort of close communion is described as a face-to-face -face communion. Um, but, you see, by this time, they had heard God walking in the garden as they were used to. But sadly, they had sinned, you see. And then we read this. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. And the presence of the Lord in the Hebrew literally means the face of the Lord God. So after they had sinned, they were to, uh, basically, you would say, afraid to look God in the face. They hid from his face. That's what it means, they hid from the presence. And they had deliberately, of course, disobeyed God listened to the lies of the serpent and doubted God and failed to trust him. And of course, they sinned terribly. And this is why the whole world which sinned in Adam needs a savior. And uh, so as fallen creatures ruined by sin, scripture says, it could no longer be possible to look upon God's face. If we were to see God face to face directly, we would perish. His glory would consume our sinful nature. Exodus 33:11 says, and the Lord spake to Moses face to face, just as a man speaketh 
uh, to his friend. In other words, they had intimate communion, but Moses didn't actually see God's face because God said to him, Thou canst not see my face, for there uh, shall no man see me and live. And you know when God, Moses asked to see God's glory, God said he would send, show all his goodness, uh, but he, would, he had to hide uh, Moses in the cleft of the rock. He put his hand over him and he passed by, all his goodness passed by. The glory of God passes by. It's a great theme in the Old Testament. But only after he had passed by did he, God take his hand away and Moses only got to see the back of God. He didn't see God's face. And those in the Old Testament who experienced the appearances of God, what the theologians call theophanies, uh, people like Gideon, for example, where the pre-incarnate Christ, the angel of the Lord, as he is termed, appears. Uh, they communicate with him and then they discover who he, who he really was and they fear then suddenly that they will die because they've seen, seen the face of God but they hadn't actually seen the unveiled face of God. They did not die but it's a dreadful thing for a sinner to be exposed to the unveiled face of God and that's why since sin has entered the world, that we don't experience direct appearances of God for our sake. Otherwise, that would destroy us. He no longer walks in the cool of the, uh, the day in the garden. Yet, in another sense, he continued to do so in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul uh, said to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But of course, even in Christ, the glory of God is veiled. You remember the account of the Mount of, the Mount of Transfiguration where Christ began to shine brighter than the noonday sun, when more of his glory then was momentarily unveiled. And of course, the glory of Christ after his ascension into heaven was like a flashing brightness that dazzled Saul and blinded Saul on the road to Damascus. But it is because Christ was born of a virgin and walked through this sinful world in the flesh, finding not a garden anymore, but a wilderness full of thorns, thorns which would be used to crown him, and then was nailed to the tree to bear the punishment that we sinners deserve, and died in our place and rose again, ascended back into glory because of all that. That mighty work, <clears throat> sinners one day will be able to look upon the face of God directly once more. And they shall see his face. It's a most glorious promise and statement there. Think on the cost to God then to let us look upon his face. God the Father had to hide his face from his own dearly beloved son when the son was bearing our sins and bearing the wrath upon these sins. He cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The son who through all eternity was face to face with the father felt the father's face turn away from him in that moment on the cross. You know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. When it says the Word was with God, it's 
towards God. That's what it literally means, and some would translate it face to face with God. How tragic that the Father had to turn his face away because his eyes are too pure to look upon sin. And when he saw his dearly beloved Son made sin for us, the Father turned away and the Son felt the withdrawing of the fellowship of his Father, the fellowship he enjoyed from all eternity. Who can begin to fathom what it cost the Father and the Son and the Spirit to enable us one day to be able to look upon the face of God in perfect safety, without the fear of being consumed, but to enjoy it safely, gladly, and forevermore, the face of God. Because we will be changed into holy creatures who are given the power to enable us to bear happily the face of God. Christ's work on Calvary, when it's applied to an individual by the Holy Spirit, allows Christ to present to himself, as the scripture says, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The miracle, life-changing uh, power of God will allow that for us. Now, the phrase, they shall see his face then, We, we don't fear destruction. You know, I think some people fear that somehow, even though they, they feel they've trusted in God, that somehow at the very end, well, God will turn against us. You know, God will not do that. God loves us. He loves us enough to have punished once and for all our sin in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no punishment waiting for those whose sins were already punished. God is just. He doesn't punish sin twice. There will be no fear of destruction when we look into the face of God. The phrase, they shall see his face, then also tells us that they shall see the actual face of the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the glorified God-man. He will forever have his humanity glorified. John the Apostle, while still a sinner dwelling on earth, had a vision of Christ. And uh, we are familiar with it. He said he was one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And what was John's reaction to that vision as a sinner? He fell down as a dead man. But now John is in the glory, perfected by Christ. He can behold the glorious face, that awesome vision it conveys something of the awesomeness of Christ in all his glory. But John will be looking at this awesome Christ with joy, not dread. He'll not be falling down as a dead man. He'll be falling down in worship, but he'll thoroughly enjoy seeing the, the, the face of God. Perfect love, you see, has cast out all fear. Now the phrase, they shall see his face, reminds us then 
that they are in the presence of God Almighty. I, I, I've told you that the face can convey the idea of presence, the presence of their heavenly Father, and in the presence of the Lamb that was slain. It is the presence of God, after all, that makes heaven heaven. And they shall see his face, reminds us that they shall see the expression on God's face, which betrays what God thinks about everyone there. His inward thoughts will be conveyed to us by the expression on his face. And his love for the redeemed, he is well pleased with them. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That will be said by Christ's loving, smiling eyes. They shall see his face reminds us also that we do so arrive in heaven because of no merit of our own. Here's the bit about impartiality, no bribery. We have done nothing to deserve the privilege. It's only because God has lifted up our faces to see his face by his sovereign will and his work on the cross. God is no respecter of persons. He's utterly impartial. We did not flatter him or bribe him so that he had to turn his face towards us, far from it. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no one who does good, no, not one. So this phrase, they shall see his face, is only possible because we are in Christ and because of his work on the cross. God turns his face then to the believer and only to the believer. No longer are they like Adam who ran into the bushes to hide from the face of God. Rather, the believer basks in the radiance, the brightness of God's glory. They see his face. And that glory transforms us on earth. Isn't it true that the bride and the bridegroom gaze lovingly into one another's eyes on their wedding day? And we would like to think also that they spend the rest of their life gazing into one another's eyes. But the redeemed bride of Christ, the church, shall do likewise. They shall gaze upon their bridegroom Christ for all eternity the redeemed are those who first love Christ on earth, of course. Now, what is the typical world's view of Christ? A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. That's what the world thinks of Christ. But the Christian, they see the beauty of Christ, even in the man crucified, the world says about Christ, he has no form or comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. God's servant's visage was, more, it was so marred more than any man. That's how he appeared, hanging on a cross. He was like a leper cast outside the city gate, and the world despised him and looked away. And yet, the Christian, when he looks at the crucified Christ, what does he see? The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And on earth, in faith, we look upon Christ's beautiful face. By faith, we, like Moses, endure and see him who is unseen. And in glory, we shall see his face in all his glory. 
And while on earth we learn to despise all who would persuade us to turn away from Christ and make us afraid to own Christ, perhaps because of fear of persecution, we despise them in that sense for trying to dissuade us from Christ. Because God says to us, as he said to Jeremiah, be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee. What of those who do not love the Lord Jesus and who have not given their hearts to him, who are not born of the Spirit? Well, on the day of judgment, they shall be confronted with the face of God also. On earth, they spat in the face of God. When they see his glory, they will not be able to bear the presence and the face of God. In fact, it will be a torment for them to see God. They were not born again by the Holy Spirit on earth, so they arrive in a condition of uncleanness, and they cannot bear God's holiness, and God cannot bear their uncleanness, and so God casts them out from his presence into the outer darkness where there is no praise, no singing, but weeping and gnashing of teeth. The face of God has not been turned towards them in mercy. They arrived thinking that they had done good works, perhaps, enough to merit salvation. But God is no respecter of persons. They are outside of Christ, and God makes no exceptions. They can't bribe him. The look on God's face tells them what he thinks of them. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Nothing but terror and torment falls upon them. Their dread is so great that they would love just to be obliterated, to cease to exist. Far from gazing upon God and seeing the beauty of his face, they rather see the wrath of Christ in his face. The lamb's face to them is fearful. They cannot bear it, and they beg to be destroyed and Revelation 6, verses 16 and 17 says this about them. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? You know, God is very earnest about souls. God saves souls, and God damns souls. There's no one more serious about souls than God. And being a religious do-gooder is not enough. You have to stand face to face with a holy God. You have to be born again and made perfect by the Spirit before you can happily see the face of God. If the miracle of the new birth does not happen to you while on, you are on earth, you will arrive before his face in a state of uncleanness, and his face then will be a terrifying sight to you, so that you would rather call to the mountains and be buried under the mountains rather than have to look at the face of the Lamb. So we have to say this in conclusion. You are either already at peace with God through faith in Christ, and obediently you are living face to face with him in a spiritual union and communion daily, or you're still dead in your sins 
And the Lord is not your Lord. You don't bow the knee to him, and therefore he's not your savior. So today, this phrase, and they shall see his face, it either fills you with peace and joy and longing for heaven, or it fills you with the fear of death and the dread of hell. We must remember the encouragement. Revelation 22, 3. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, which means the nature, they'll be partakers of the divine nature. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. We can be so happy tonight for our loved ones that have gone before us knowing because they trusted in Christ that now they see his face. And I suppose at the end of the day when this sad world is over, there's only one thing that will matter, and it is that you and I will see God's face. Such satisfaction, such joy, such arrival at our destiny to see Christ and to be, to discover that we are made like him, to see his face. There's nothing more precious than to be with him and to see his face. And yet that is why he died, to make sure that anyone who wants to see his face in all love for him will see his face. They shall see his face. You can die happily with that promise because God keeps his promises. Amen. We want to finish now by singing Psalm 16. Psalm 16, which, of course, is one of the prophecies of the resurrection of Christ, but of course, because of his resurrection, we will be raised one day if we're united to him through faith. And so I would like us to sing from verse 6 to the end of Psalm 16. Verse 6, and to me happily the lines in pleasant places fell. Yea, the inheritance I got in beauty doth excel. I bless the Lord, because he doth by counsel me conduct, and in the seasons of the night my reins do me instruct. And of course the psalm ends, before thy face at thy right hand are pleasures evermore. So, verses 6 to 11.
Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.